BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Friday, and anything goes Friday, and we're going to be discussing a subject that I've wanted to cover for quite some time now. I was actually on Wikipedia once, and this suggested article came up, like one of the related articles about something and there was a photo of someone named Elizabeth Stride, also known as Long Liz Stride, and it was actually a photo from a mortuary, and I thought that it was quite gruesome, and, and you could even use the word horrific, and I clicked on the image to read the article simply to learn more about her, and I discovered that she was one of the victims of Jack the Ripper, and then I found that she actually has one of the least gruesome photos after viewing some of the other from the crime scenes associated with Jack the Ripper. And as you can hear by that already, I am an absolute novice when it comes to learning about Jack the Ripper. I mean, a complete beginner. So I've been corresponding with Jerry B., who has shared a lot of things with me about Jack the Ripper and the murder of Elizabeth Stride. So um, I'm going to be relying a lot on his notes, and we will get to that later on in the episode. But uh, before the... um show truly takes off, I do need to give that um, preface that I am somewhat of an outsider to this material, and it's going to be coming at it from a fresh set of eyes. Sometimes a new set of eyes can have a very unique take on the subject, and maybe you can see something that is just a little bit different, and I frequently cite Toshiro Mifune from the movie Sanjuro when he says, sometimes outside eyes can have the best view. So for somebody like me, who has been learning about the um, Ripper only recently. I will share some things with you. And because you probably heard in the introduction, every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. There are lots of things about the Zodiac Killer on this channel. If you are listening for the first time, then there will be a few sentences throughout the duration of this recording comparing Jack the Ripper to the Zodiac Killer. But I also wanted to ask you guys, do you want to hear a longer extended episode on like a comparison between Jack the Ripper and the Zodiac Killer. Soren Korsgaard even has a book out called America's Jack the Ripper, which is all about the Zodiac Killer. And, um, well, I think we could save that for a future episode, but would you like to hear an episode on that material, the similarities and the differences between the Ripper and the Zodiac? And the last thing I would like to say in this introductory segment is, if you're someone who is an expert on Jack the Ripper, and you know the material very well, for somebody like me who is a beginner trying to give a new take on the subject, I would appreciate it if you share your expertise in the comments section. If anybody wants to weigh in on the subject, please put some comments down below so we can continue the discussion. And if I make any mistakes, please feel free to correct me. I'm always open to correction. But the first thing I would like to do throughout, the first thing I would like to do for this episode, excuse me, is to go over to jacktheripper.org, such an appropriate title for such an appropriate subject, and they have a timeline that has been created for Elizabeth Stride, Long Liz Stride, and she was born on November 27th, 1843, in Stora, which is on Hissingen Island in Sweden, and she's going to grow up to become an alleged victim of Jack the Ripper, because the whole mystery surrounding Elizabeth Stride is that was she actually a victim of the Ripper, or was the Ripper interrupted in um, his activities, and did he have to move on to another victim, or is this simply the case of somebody taking credit for a murder that he didn't commit? But she's born in 1843, November 27th, in October, of 1863, she moves to Gothenburg, Sweden, excuse my horrendous mispronunciation, and in 1864, 
Actually, it's really 1861 to 1864. She's working as a servant for a family. In 1865, she was registered as a prostitute by the Swedish police. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because Elizabeth Stride is going to be murdered in her mid-40s, of course, in 1888, as um, the Ripper operated in 1888. But when you hear that date of her birth, that she was born in 1843, then that means that puts her around... 40, uh, f just, uh, just shy of her, um, 45th birthday, I would say, and then, so, quite older than some of the other victims in the Ripper case. Age is very important when you're looking at serial killers. Why, while, while I'm not an expert on Jack the Ripper, there are many true crime episodes on this channel, and there are a lot of discussions about serial killer psychology, and I will firstly tell you that serial killers very frequently tend to operate within the same demographics, such as age, gender, um, maybe other certain uh, biometrics. They uh, might even have a certain type of hair color that they are targeting. And with um, many serial killers, they will often focus in on a woman or a female in a certain age demographic, or maybe they will target men who are in a certain age demographic. Many people believe that serial killers operate within their own sexual orientation, such as if um, a man is gay, then he will target other men for his victims, or if it's a straight person, then they will target someone whom they are attracted to, like a female serial killer will target um, male victims, and then a male heterosexual serial killer will target female victims. I really had to backtrack from that statement because... There's just too much contradictory evidence to explain that. I mean, there are all these exceptions to the rule that just prove overwhelming. You'll find a gay serial killer who has also targeted uh, women. You'll find a straight serial killer who's a straight male who will also target men. So that's just simply not true. But I did want to point out, firstly, the age demographic of Long Liz Stride, who was murdered um, in her mid-40s. And that's something important to note. Then next we have 1865. She is registered as a prostitute by the Swedish police. Okay, and the thing that I have learned looking into this is that she was the first victim of the Ripper, and maybe the only victim of the Ripper, who did not become a prostitute because of the poverty of England. As you heard, she's born in Sweden, and she started this at a much earlier time and was a prostitute for many years. And if I can jump around a little bit in her timeline, it seems like she was kind of going in and out of the profession. But moving on to the next line here, 1865, well, it's April of 1865 to May of 1865. She was an inpatient at Kuhasit, the Hospital for the Treatment of Venereal Disease, August 30th, 1865 to the 23rd of September, 1865. She was an inpatient at the hospital a second time. October 1865 to November 1st of 1865, third time in the hospital. And then um, to move on to something a little bit more vital, February 7th, 1866, she sailed to London. And in that same year, she registered with the Swedish church in East London. And uh, some trivia about Elizabeth Stride is that she would go on to not only learn English in addition to her native Swedish, she also became fluent in Yiddish, so says the Internet. On March 7th, 1869, married John Thomas Stride, where she gets the last name. And um, there are some, also some discrepancies of how she spelled her birth name. Her her birth name was um, Gustav's daughter, spelled G-U-S-T-A-F-S-D-O-T-T-E-R. Looks like Gustav's daughter, but um, that was her birth name, and then she takes the name Stride from her husband. In 1869, they opened a coffee shop. 1870 or 1871, they moved to 178 Poplar High Street and took up residence a few doors away. Um, the, meaning the uh, coffee shop they opened moved to that address, and then their residence moved a couple doors away. 1877, sent to the Poplar Workhouse from the Thames Magistrates Court, although the reason is unknown. Uh, from looking into other things, particularly the uh, life of Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man, um, I've learned about these workhouses. Ebenezer Scrooge also talks about the workhouses in A Christmas Carol, and it appears that they are described as prisons for the poor, like the activities and actions of people are in the workhouse are 
only uh, done to keep the workhouse going, like they might have gardens and they might have some farm animals, and the people who are living there are only working to just feed the people who are in the workhouse. They're just there to alleviate the poverty because they have nowhere else for these people to go. So um, that's my understanding of it. 1878. A steamer sinks called the Princess Alice, and Elizabeth Stride would later claim that her husband and two children were among the dead. However, this claim has been disproved. That'll come up later. 1879. Petitioned the Swedish Church for financial assistance. 1881. The couple were residing at 69 Usher Road. 1881. The marriage broke down and the couple separated. And jumping ahead. 1884. John Stride died of heart disease in the Stepney Sick Asylum. 1886, made claims for financial assistance from the support of the Swedish Church. 1887 to 1888, was convicted for drunkenness at the Thames Magistrates Court with no fewer than eight occasions. Wow, that's a big one. 1888, so now, now we're on to something. September 1888, she spent the day cleaning rooms at the Common Lodging House. And then, September 29th. 1888, 6.30 p.m., was paid sixpence for her chores and went to the Queen's Head pub at the junction of Commercial Street and Fashion Street. Let's look at the time again. 6.30 p.m. These times are going to be important. 7 p.m., she returned to the lodging house and borrowed clothes and a brush from fellow lodger Charles Preston. She headed out looking cheerful. 11 p.m. on September 29th, she was seen by a man, J. Best and John Gardner, outside of the Bricklayer's Arms on Settles. I think the Bricklayer's Arms was a pub, if I recall from other sources. September 29th, 1888, 11.45 p.m. She is seen with a man in Burner Street by William Marshall. Also at 11.45 p.m., the storekeeper Matthew Packer claims to have sold her grapes and also a man was present with her. So he sold both Elizabeth Shride and this man some grapes. 12.30 a.m., Police Constable William Smith saw her and the man standing outside of Dutfield's yard on Burner Street. 12.45 a.m., September 30th now, James Brown saw a woman who, was fairly, who he fairly certain was Elizabeth Stride standing with a man in Fairclaw Street. 12.45 a.m. as well, Israel Schwartz saw her being assaulted and thrown to the ground on the pavement in front of Dutfield's yard on Burner Street. So those both both of those sightings were around 12.45 a.m. Now, at 1 a.m., Louis Deemschutz pulled his pony and cart into Dutfield's yard and found her body. Are you uh, noticing something about this timeline? Does something seem out of place, seem a little bit fishy to you? Does something that even a novice like me, who has a very minimal understanding of Jack the Ripper, get a few red flags going off? There's a sighting of her at 12.45 a.m., and this is by this guy, Israel Schwartz, who sees her being assaulted and thrown to the ground on the pavement in front of Dutfield's yard. And then, 15 minutes later, she is found dead. As someone who also looks into serial killers, um, this is definitely not typical behavior of somebody who has been going to spend such a long amount of time grooming a victim and trying to stoke them up, and then they're going to assault them in somewhat of a public area when they could be seen rather easily. I mean, it sounds like it's right out in the street, according to this description here. And then someone is going to commit a crime like the activities of the Ripper, and mutilating the body, more or less, but then did this person get interrupted when they tried to lure her to a more secluded area? Those two things do not seem to go together. Someone who is being vicious, rough, taking enorm an enormous amount of risk, whereas the activities of Jack the Ripper seem much more cold, methodical, and calculating to an outsider like me. So I noticed that as an immediate red flag, and I'm very suspicious of this. Another uh, source, it may have even actually been the Wikipedia page, said that the murder of Elizabeth Stride is the only Ripper victim who who was found south of Whitechapel Road. So that also is like a geographic pointer that they think is quite different. Um, I mean, I do not know an enormous amount about all of this, 
So I am open to correction or open to hear about what other people have to say. And that time frame, though, I mean, 15 minutes. If you want to go outside and just sit on a rock and look at a field for 15 minutes, you'll notice that it's a very long amount of time. I mean, something could have definitely happened. In there, a situation could have calmed down. Someone could have been lured. And that's where the timeline ends here on jacktheripper.org. Uh, but um, I think the more famous story is that Somebody pulled in, well, we, oh, I mean, it's actually Deem Shoes. He pulls in with the horse um, and cart, the pony and cart, rather, and then he finds the body of Elizabeth Stride, and then he immediately goes to get help, and he believed that the person who had committed the murder was still hiding in there, and then that person exits while he's going to get help and then disappears into the night. But here's something, though, that you don't find in the Zodiac Killer mystery. Allegedly, the Ripper may have gone on and murdered another victim on the same night. His attempted his attempt at mutilating the body of Long Liz Stride did not happen, so he finds another victim within an hour. Um that's also horribly, horribly bizarre. But right now I would like to go over to the emails that uh Jerry B and I have been exchanging and anybody can write the show at Blackbox Online Radio at AOL dot com. Let's look at the first one here. Some people think that Elizabeth Stride was not a Ripper victim because she was not mutilated like most of the others, but I say otherwise. The killer was interrupted. Everybody knows the story of how Louis Diemschutz, and um, yes, there's an alternative spelling used here of his name, the guy that we said found the body, discovered Elizabeth Stride's body, and most believe that he is the one who disturbed the killer. But the records show that there was a witness who, who saw a man throw Stride to the ground. When the guy saw the witness... He yelled out, Lipsky. Lipsky was the name of a Jewish man who had been hanged a year before for murdering a woman not far away from the Stride murder scene. This, to me, is the most likely disturbance and a reason for Stride to have received only a slit throat. I think the most likely theory, which is not altogether a theory but rather a story, is the Masonic Angle, a story told to Stephen Knight by Joseph Sickert. I highly recommend Knight's book, Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution. Um, so he seems to think very clearly that Elizabeth Stride was murdered by the Ripper, and I never said that she wasn't, and very simply that um, the first uh, point is that this is something that is debated, this is widely discussed, and people are rather uncertain about whether or not Elizabeth Stride was um, murdered by Jack the Ripper or not, but... Um, there was a letter that was mailed after the murder of Elizabeth Stride, this is called the Saucy Jack Postcard, which was received on the 1st of October, 1888, and it reads, I was not cutting, dear old boss, when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about Saucy Jack's work tomorrow. Double event this time. Number one squealed a bit, couldn't finish straight off, had not time to get ears off. For police, thanks for keeping last letter back till I got to work again. Jack the Ripper. And, um, I mean, you can hear that very clear reference. Double event this time. One squealed a bit, couldn't finish straight off. I mean, all of that seems to be consistent because, um, the important thing to share about Elizabeth Stride is that she died from having a slit throat. I believe it was actually, um, oh, they, uh, listed these, uh, even, it's even on the Wikipedia page. Yeah, due to a severed carotid artery, the left carotid artery and the severance of the trachea, which is a very medical way of saying a slit throat. I mean, I did notice a couple red flags, but you do have that letter, and I mean, whether it's Jack the Ripper or the Zodiac Killer, you can see how the letters link things together, and then um, these uh, parts of the story are becoming more and more aligned. But then you would have to beg the question, if Elizabeth Stride was not a murder victim of the Ripper, well, what's going on? I mean, why would people be thinking that in the first place? Is it just the proximity? Is it just because she was close by to another victim of the Ripper? I mean, what would be the motivation? I mean, if she, or if she was not, then why would the Ripper take credit for it and say that there's this double event, so um, she squealed, so she only got a slit throat? Well, I'll go on to Jerry B.'s next message, and then we can um, 
we can discuss that question throughout the duration of this recording, just a couple of facts. Robert Anderson took over as assistant commissioner just as the Ripper crimes were started. He then left on an extended vacation and didn't come back until the last murder. On the other hand, the chief of police, Charles Warwick, resigned his duties immediately after the last murder. These things would have had greater meaning if you knew the whole story. It would seem that these guys were put into their positions for purpose. Chief Warren is the one who ordered the writing on the wall rubbed out. And, um, though we haven't mentioned that yet, but that's, uh, well, well actually I'll just keep reading. Now, why would he do that? That was the night of the double murder of Elizabeth Stride and Kate Idawas. I get, I think it's pronounced Idawas, actually. But, um... There, she would be the name of the person who was murdered after Elizabeth Stride. Uh, this is something odd that's also very odd with the timeline, that if he spends all this time trying to court and groom his victim to get her to a vulnerable place, yet I mean, he can so easily find another victim within an hour. I mean, that's some, some, something about that is just very bizarre to me. As for the victims, just remember that they knew each other. That's important when considering that the reason that that was the reason they had to die, at least according to Joseph Sickert. Concerning the letter sent by the killer, the From Hell letter is the only one that has evidence of being authentic. It contained a package that held half of a kidney of a woman, and the kidney was tested and almost certainly came from Catherine E. Dow's, who was killed on the same night as Liz Stride. Yes, Catherine E. Dow's, the, um, woman who was murdered later on. She also went by Kate, and she's referred to as Kate in many of the other sources. And if, if anybody would like to hear a dramatic reading of the, um, of the victims of Jack the Ripper, there is this channel out there called Nina Soden, N-I-N-A, Nina Soden, S-O-D-E-N. And there's this dramatic reading of two actresses who are uh, playing the parts of the different Ripper victims, uh, Kate Hidows and Elizabeth Stride. And I would invite everyone to listen to their episode. It's about 16 and a half minutes long, and I'll just play a very short clip right here, and we can hear what they have to say. So, let's just have a listen. I'm saying, I'm just saying it explains it, why he took two of us in one night. After he left Liz here and got Phil Jaws, he took about a 10 minute walk and then he met me. Took me to Mida Square. You want to talk about should have known better? Mm -hmm. Mida Square is enclosed by businesses. It's all closed at night. There's nobody there. It's deserted. There ain't no lights or nothing. I couldn't even see the night that was so dark. And by that time, they found my body in Duckfield Square and raised the alarm. Oh, there were coppers everywhere. There was even one in Mitre Square. His beat took him through about 1.30, and when he came back through about 1.45, he found me. Oh, what was left of me, laying there with my head next to a cold grate, all cut to pieces. In less than a quarter hour, he met me, took me to the square, murdered me, and then did... What he did. Tell him everything. You're so much about telling the truth. Tell him what he took. He cut off a piece of my skirt and took it with him. That's not all he took. Don't you gloat, Liz Stride. It could have been you if there hadn't been so many people there and he, and he hadn't had to get away. Tell him what he took. Some things are not decent to speak of. My left kidney, that's what he took with him. Are you happy now? And that was once again from the channel Nina Soden. If anyone would like to hear the full extended version, it's called Episode 5, Elizabeth Longliz Stride and Kate Idawas. The Victims of Jack the Ripper Speak. It's a dramatic reading slash presentation on what um, they may have been thinking if they're looking at it from beyond the grave and so on. I think you get the idea about that, but I was very impressed with that. I liked all the storytelling elements as well as the theatrical 
presentation, but I did tell you guys that we would explore this from an angle of if the, if someone was taking credit for murders that they did not commit, or if someone is just so set on murdering people at certain times, or what would be the motivation for these things at all? Is this purely about purely about just trying to commit psychopathic, torturous, cold, methodical, and calculating thrill kills? Or is there something else going on here? Because you even heard the question that we've been exploring throughout the entire episode. Was Long Liz Stride a genuine victim of Jack the Ripper? Or is she a person that Jack the Ripper took credit for murdering? And there are so many questions that are going on right now. So I would like to go on to another... Um, message that Jerry B has sent me and anyone can feel free to respond to these if you want to challenge any of the points or just what do you have to say in general but let's read off this the whole Jack the Ripper case according to the story told by Joseph Sickard has to do with Prince Eddie the grandson of Queen Victoria first a little background on Joseph Sickard Joseph claimed to be an illegitimate son of the painter Walter Sickard who himself plays a role in the Ripper killings, according to some theories. Joseph said that his father, Walter, told him about what really happened in 1888. The story goes that Prince Eddie, the future heir to the throne, had an affair with a commoner, a girl by the name of Annie Crook. Annie was not only a commoner, but also a Catholic, which was against the policies of the throne. The couple is said to have gotten married in a private ceremony which was known only to a few trusted friends, among which were Walter Sickert and also a young woman named Mary Kelly. Mary Kelly's friends were Polly Nichols, Annie Chapman, and Liz Stride. These women all knew each other and drank at the same pub, as well as sharing the same trade. They were all prostitutes, and they all ended up being victims of Jack the Ripper, Mary Kelly, and maybe the other women as well, knew Walter Sickert. Sickert had used Mary as a model, and she had painted, and he had painted her portrait, excuse me. Mary also knew Annie Crook, the young woman who married Prince Eddie. Eddie and Annie had a child together, and they named the girl Alice Margaret. Eventually, word got back to the Queen, and something had to be done, for if all this news got out, the throne could be in serious trouble of collapse. The story goes that Lord Salisbury, the Prime Minister, hatched a plan to take care of the problem. The problem was that there were witnesses to all of these happenings, and they had to be silenced. Chief among these witnesses was Mary Kelly. It is said that a raid took place and the prince was taken back to the palace, but Annie Crook was sent to a mental facility where she underwent some sort of mental operation which rendered her a mental case. This operation was performed by the Queen's own surgeon, Sir William Gull. Gull was a high-ranking mason and was given an even more heinous task of disposing of the women who knew too much. So, I mean, you hear that one theory out there, and I would invite everyone who um, is an expert on the Ripper case to explore the um, ideas, post your own theory in the comment section, or do you agree with that, or does that make sense to you? Jerry B.'s next email was, Remember, Walter Sigurd had painted a portrait of Mary Kelly. It's not 100% clear to what extent Walter Sigurd went in the killings, but according to the story, this portrait was used to track down Mary Kelly. Polly Nichols was the first to fall. Then Annie Chapman, followed by Liz Stride. The next victim, Catherine E. Dow's, what is said to have been a case of mistaken identity. It's important to note that Idows at the time was using the surname Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y. She also had dark hair, like the portrait of Mary Kelly. Then the last of the canonical five was Mary Kelly herself, and she, as you probably know, was mutilated far worse than any of the others. You know, I kind of work in reverse order, and I'm not going to post the photo of Mary Kelly, but, um, when I say reverse order, I started out like following true crime stuff, being very um, insensitive to everything. And I found that the more I learn about true crime cases, the more I get bothered and agitated and even upset by some of the gruesome acts that people commit in the true crime world. Even just hearing about it on a podcast can really make you um, 
very um, uh, unsettled. And when I saw the photo of the mutilated body of Mary Kelly, which is available here on the internet, I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe this. It's um, absolutely an absolutely horrific act that happened to her. But um, as Jerry has written here, she was mutilated far worse than any of the others. The only one who came close to was Catherine Edows, which is a reason to believe that the killer thought he was killing Mary Kelly. The murders were not only done with the heinous mutilations, but they were done in obvious Masonic rituals. Rituals which were performed in mimic at all Masonic ceremonies. These rituals include cutting an enemy's throat from left to right, disemboweling an enemy, among other things, all of which were done to the five women who dared to come against the throne. Note, the Masonic ritual of disemboweling an enemy included placing the bowels over the shoulders, and this was done with at least two of the Ripper victims. Also, the writing on the Golston Street wall, which the killer left after mutilating Catherine Edows, makes the Masonic connections pretty clear. More, more on that later, that's what the email says, but um, yeah, just the writing on the wall, like there was a message that was written on the wall that what happened after the murders of Liz Stride and Kate Edows, as uh, Jerry has written there. But um, there are numerous theories, though, and I think that that is something that's very important to remember. I mean, while Jerry's narrative is something that I can follow and comprehend from a logical standpoint, I, I mean, of course, this is still an unsolved case. But um, he goes on to say, Just a couple of facts. Robert Anderson took over the job as assistant commissioner just as the Ripper crime started and didn't come back till after the extended vacation. All right, I already got that one. But, um, and the story goes on that the prime minister of Salisbury set it all up and the actual butcher was William Gull. So a suspect has been named. And there are numerous suspects, I mean... They're the ones that I had thought of in the past, or heard of, rather, was um, the Polish immigrant, the silversmith, and most famously, the elephant man, Joseph Merrick, sometimes referred to as John Merrick, but most people now go, call him Joseph Carey Merrick, his legal name at the time, birth name rather than legal name, I don't think anyone was paying too close attention. No, the uh, the elephant man, Joseph Merrick, was actually listed on some of the more outrageous conspiracy theories out there, or just outrageous theories, period. And, I mean, obviously, Joseph Merrick was not Jack the Ripper, because um, the uh, deformities that the elephant man experienced also would have affected his hands, and... Um, just the concept of mutilating a body or something would have been extraordinarily difficult. I mean, and um, I I don't even think we need to explore that theory. I'm as you can see, I don't hold too much weight in that. But I do really appreciate the messages that Jerry B has sent to me about Jack the Ripper, and in his theory, Long Liz Stride is a very definitive. Ripper victim. It wasn't a case of um, someone taking credit for a murder that he didn't commit. It wasn't anything to do with the media publications. She was a genuine Ripper victim. And you heard that whole thing about the um, the unwanted marriage involving the British crown, and they wanted to silence people who knew of the ceremony. Please share your ideas in the comments section below. Now for the next part here, I want to go over to a book that I have mentioned numerous times on the channel. This is called The Myth of the Zodiac Killer, because I remembered when I was reading this book that there was a section on Jack the Ripper. One more time, The Myth of the Zodiac Killer by Thomas Henry Horan. And I would like to go to page 133 in the book and just have a reason. The Zodiac created his own identity through a handful of confessions, threats, greeting cards, and cryptograms mailed to the San Francisco Chronicle and Examiner between July of 1969 and July of 1970. One letter was mailed to the Los Angeles Times in 1971. Outside of his letters, virtually nothing is known of the Zodiac, although pop culture and the true crime genre habitually lumped the Zodiac in with other famous serial killers like Jack the Ripper as well as BTK. The Zodiac stands alone by virtue of the simple fact that there is zero evidence 
apart from his letters, that he ever existed at all. And yet those letters created one of the most famous historical characters in American culture. This book examines how such a thing could be possible in general, and how specifically the Zodiac Killer letters have filled a particular need for so many readers. There are other examples of this phenomenon, of course. Forensic evidence, modus operandi, and other factors have convinced professional and amateur criminalists, past and present, that one man murdered at least five women in London in the summer and fall of 1888. Several letters, some signed Jack the Ripper and some signed with other names, were mailed to the police and newspapers, taking credit for these and other slayings, except one letter addressed from hell, sent to the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, and um, I believe, we already read that one off, that's the one that contains the uh, part of the kidney, so, well, I mean, you can follow along there except for one letter addressed from hell and sent to the head of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, these letters are commonly considered to be hoaxes. All right, and the myth of the Zodiac Killer also puts forward the Jack the Ripper hoax theory, and that, yes, there's one authentic letter, but the hoaxes in the sense, would when this term hoax is used in the true crime world, there is a meaning that someone is taking credit for murders that they did com not commit. They're trying to make people think that there is this serial killer presence out there, when in fact there is not one. But this is one of the reasons why I was asking at the beginning, do you want to hear an episode on the Zodiac versus Jack the Ripper? Look at some of the things that were just written on this one single page. The Whitechapel murders are taking place in the summer and fall of 1888, the Zodiac Killer also only operated in the summer and the fall. I mean, the first uh, canonical Zodiac crime is on the 20th of December 1968, still in fall, then Blue Rock Springs, Lake Berryessa, and the Paul Stein murder, all in the summer and the fall. It really is um quite remarkable. And listen to these other things here, talking about mailing letters, postcards, I mean, this stuff's all really very, very similar. I mean, th there isn't even just one episode. We could do probably 10 hours just on all of these similarities versus the differences between the Zodiac Killer and um, and Jack the Ripper. And I've said it once, and I'll say, I'll say it again, that the Zodiac Killer almost certainly studied Jack the Ripper very closely, as well as the Texarkana Moonlight Murders of 1946. But um, I, because we talk about the Zodiac Killer a lot on this channel, you can always like and subscribe if you want to follow along with these discussions. You have something similar, though, like in the Zodiac Killer mystery, you have the story of Sherry Jo Bates, who was murdered in Riverside, California in 1966. And then when I saw that Long Liz Stride is, um, was murdered in 1888, but people still aren't sure if she is a genuine Jack the Ripper victim, the same, same way they aren't sure that Sherry Jo Bates was a genuine Zodiac killer victim. And I noticed a lot of these things pointing together, or they were, there were a lot of, um, very, very similar arrangements that were, um, made by the theorists. And I think it may have even been Jerry B who has written a lot of the, um, a lot of the messages that I was reading off here, um, who said that someone had posted a Zodiac Killer theory on this channel about how they believed that Darlene Farron, the victim at the Blue Rock Springs shooting on July 4th of 1969, was a, um, a center point for the Zodiac mystery, that the whole thing is about Darlene, the whole reason why there was a Zodiac Killer, getting away from the myth of the Zodiac Killer and the myth of Jack the Ripper, that is, is because somebody wanted to murder Darlene Farron. So what they did was they committed a series of additional murders to cover it up and to make it look like there's this um, prolific serial killer on the loose. And there is, but it's not about any type of cold, methodical, and calculating arrangement. What it's actually about is just somebody wanted to murder an ex-girlfriend or an ex-lover, perhaps, and then they committed additional murders to confuse the authorities. And there is one more layer in that theory that um, that um, the uh, first uh, two murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen in December of 1968 were the result of either somebody mistaken 
mistaking the identity of one of the victims, thinking that he saw Darlene Farron with a guy and just got into rage, so he murdered them accidentally, or case of mistaken identity, I don't think that that is likely at all, to be honest. In fact, I think that, uh, that a better way of phrasing that one, even though it is not my own theory, is that somebody just simply saw a man and a woman together and then erupted into their own type of, um, their own type of murderous rage out of jealousy, or they were thinking of some bad experiences that they had in the past, but, um, that is up for debate and discussion. That's not even my own theory, but a lot of people have very similar theories between Jack the Ripper and the Zodiac Killer. They are looking at this from the angle of one person may be the key victim, and then they want to build the case around that. And I think Jerry said that Mary Kelly was the key victim in the Jack the Ripper case, and the other murders were additional. Um, they were additional murders to disguise what was truly going on, to confuse the authorities, to confuse the general public, were creating a type of, uh, creating a type of, er, of murderous arrangement that people wouldn't be able to figure out this murder mystery that cannot be solved, when in reality, the reason why the murder mystery can't be solved is because someone has an ulterior motive and they're trying to deceive you. Now, I would like to go over to a comment that was left by Playtime on a recent Zodiac Killer episode that talks about Jack the Ripper, and this is more in line with the uh, that book, The Myth of the Zodiac Killer, that I was reading from just a minute ago. Frederick Best was the reporter that invented Jack the Ripper in 1888. Many years after the investigation, though, Frederick Best confessed to writing the Dear Boss letter delivered on September 29, 1888. In it, the boogeyman was named Jack the Ripper. Sewing up the murders nice and tidy, it's like the same thing that happened in the Zodiac case, except we only get indirect hints to their names. The killer used a hood at Lake Berryessa and hinted to being Donald Lee Booyak with a reference of Deer Lodge Prison. Okay, I have to throw in a wild interjection, but it's possible that the name Deer Lodge was not even uttered at Lake Berryessa, but I don't want to get too bogged down on Zodiac details. Now, um... To um, they hobnobbed with the famous, and in the best cities, it is in the best interest of the police not to leave people out to dry, not to let the public think that there are multiple killers running around. It was in the newspaper's best interest to sell a super villain angle and make lots of money. Thank you, Playtime, for that comment there. All right, so with the murder of Long Liz Stride, as someone who is um, a rather rather a newcomer to the case, um, I definitely can't give you a 100% answer about whether she was a genuine Jack the Ripper victim or not. I mean, you heard theories all up and down the spectrum. One of them from Jerry is saying, yes, absolutely, and here's why. I mean, Masonic rituals or the um, actions of the British crown trying to hide wrongdoings or not exactly wrongdoings, but hide an agenda that they believed was wrong so that they could maintain their power structure. But then you hear the myth of the Zodiac Killer in that comment from Playtime that is saying there was no Jack the Ripper. They just created this a myth to... Um, or it's a mythos rather than a myth, because real murders are taking place, but what someone is doing is they are writing letters, taking credit for murders that they did not commit to create sensationalism and an interest surrounding newspapers as well as people just power tripping or the um deceptive deception going on for a number of reasons so um with the murder of long list right i do notice certain key differences i believe the um the final victim in jack the ripper what was she um definitely much younger i mean i don't even think she was 23 years old that no number has escaped me but long Liz stride was um in her mid 40s around the age of 44 and i think that's quite different than you know the age of 18 to 23 would a serial killer deviate from that pattern perhaps if he's preying on sex workers i think that that would be something normal also the fact that you have um a very clear explanation about how someone is making too much noise, doesn't want to draw attention. Something really did bother me about that timeline, though, when it is presented so clearly that someone is um, 
making this huge scene in public, yet they still want to go through a they calculated murder. Um, well, I mean, at that point, I, I, I really don't know if the predatory instincts in a cold, methodical, and calculating serial killer would be that weak. But that's just my take on the subject. Um, something bothered me about that, though, and I am definitely suspicious of these Ripper killings all being linked together, let alone that there would be two murders in a single night but only five canonical crimes. I'm also very skeptical of that. So, as you see, I'm skeptical of all of the major Jack the Ripper theories, but I'm not ready to say that there's a Jack the Ripper hoax out there. That could be a future episode, but, um... As for now, um, I think the murder of Long Liz Stride will remain unsolved, and she gets the name Long Liz for a couple of reasons, but one of them that I thought was most interesting is because the stride is a long type of stepping walk, and um, that also is how she um, holds on to her nickname, but we need to say rest in peace to Elizabeth Stride, as well as the other victims, and... Um, Maybe one day there will be genuine justice and closure and the mystery can be put to rest. These cases may be solvable with the new advances in technology. What do you think about Jack the Ripper? Please put anything you want in the comment section below. And one more time, I'll ask the question. Would you like to hear a Zodiac Killer vs. Jack the Ripper compare and contrast episode? If so, please um, put your responses in the comment section below. Or also, um, if do you think that Long Liz Stride was a genuine Jack the Ripper victim? Okay, that's all for me now. You can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also uh, follow the show on Instagram at blackboxned88. You can send in your ideas for shows in the comments section to the email or the Instagram DMs. And I will see you over on Instagram for the DM. No, what 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 is that thing that I do on Instagram? The bonus podcast. I've only I've only announced that um, in every single episode. Yet I've somehow messed it up. I'll see you guys on Instagram for the bonus podcast, and don't forget to check out the Teespring page. Links are posted in the description box, and uh, there's also something on Facebook that you can follow there if you want to. All right, well that's all for me now. One more time, I'll try it. See you on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.